Yeah, hello everybody. Yeah, I'm James, one of the occupational therapists at Wiversack Group, like um, Claire's just said there. Um, so I'm going to try to cover some ways that we support um, the young people's behaviour um, and, and some hopefully leave you with some strategies for home um, to take away with you today. So um, within the, my presentation, what I thought I'd do, I'd give you a quick introduction to myself um, and a little bit about what I do within with a Slack group. Um, go through some of like the the more common diagnoses that we see within our settings. Um, a little bit about the theory, um, I've, and I've tried to keep it as short as I can. I apologise; it might might not be the most interesting of topics. Um, I've tried to give like a, an example of a child that we like a um, a child that we may uh, work with within uh, one of the settings. Um, a bit of a discussion around why do our young people experience these challenges and um, then what we do to help. Um, so yeah, I'll move on. To, uh, so so uh, like I said, I'm one of the we're occupational therapists based within the North East and I work across four sites. Um, so my background in occupational therapy is reasonably uh, short. Uh, I only qualified in 2017. Um, and before this, I had a range of jobs from IT support in a call centre, transport manager, support worker in the community um, with adults with learning disabilities and on the autis autism spectrum and also um, within inpatient mental health settings. Um, again, mental health conditions, uh, learning disabilities and the autism spectrum. Um, after qualifying, I, I spent a year within the private sector um, working for a company that, um, that specialised in paediatric sensory integration therapies and then I did a, a completed a year in rotation in a hospital setting um, and I think this is where I'd found that where I wanted to work was was with kids because I could I, I saw the the difference that you could make um, and I have lots of fun doing my job as well so um, so I started with with us like in April 2019 at Hartwell School in Stockton on Tees, which is where I am today. Um, I cover three of the learning centres, and these all the settings are very different because um, so Hartwell here is a day school. Children generally come from either their homes or they'll come from uh, like maybe a care home if they're a looked after child. Um, whereas the learning centres, they're integrated sites, so we have. Um, the educational provision on site, but there's also a number of homes on that same site where the children live live there as well. So they're supported kind of 24 seven so we can, and they have access to therapy, you know, and, and support uh, 24 seven, which is really good. Um, so my job but in, a, in a kind of nutshell is to remove bar barriers to occupation. So I suppose within a school setting, this is primary, like the, the difficulties that we get, like the barriers to it engaging, is things like attention, concentration, um, handwriting, uh, gross motor skills, fine motor skills, bilateral skills, and these tend to be the things that teachers and learning support staff pick up on, and then they'll come and speak to me or some of the other clinical support uh, on the site to to have discussions around these. Um, so within the learning centres, there's a slightly wider scope because obviously they they live on site, so we can. Look, look more at things like personal hygiene, riding bikes, sleep hygiene, getting dressed, um, all kind of activities of daily living skills, increase independent skills. Like, so there's um, one young person I'm working with at the moment who's in a post 16 placement, and their um, their barrier to accessing um, additional education or employment is access to public transport because they're very nervous about accessing it not too sure about accessing it so i've been doing lots of work around around that and we're actually going we're planning on going to durham um on thursday so it's a it's a big step his first first trip on a train for for a long time um so yeah so how do i help in these settings i i deliver training to um to staff and within the schools and the homes um, we as a MDT approach um, with our 
internal therapy team will look at environments um, and and different behaviours that uh, we work closely with. P I work closely with like PE teachers to incorporate gross motor, balanced bilateral activities that are um, appropriate for each group of young people, and we also have um, run run groups in the class. So. Um, but I'll also deliver one-to-one -one therapy sessions. So here at Hartwell, um, I'm here, I'm very lucky here because I've got um, a center integration suite, which you can see behind me. So this is like lots of the work that I do here. I'll bring pe young people up on a one-to-one -one session and we'll just, everything's kind of play-based and, we'll, um, and we'll just work on, on set skills that have knock-on effects to, um, to help with handwriting, posture, concentration, attention. Um, and then within the learning centers, it's more, there's lots more around regulation. Um, so movement breaks and sensory motor circuits, but then also, like I said before, around the uh, activities of daily living, so exploring different reasons why people don't engage in their hygiene routines or that why they're having difficulty sleeping. Um, so, that's enough about me and, and what I do. So I've made this list of diagnosis. So um, autism spectrum disorder, attention, hy attention hyperactivity disorder, attention deficit disorder, um, DCD development coordination disorder, dyspraxia, trauma, and sensory processing difficulties. So although I've put sensory processing difficulties on there, I know you can't actually get um, a diagnosis of sensory processing um, difficulties but you can see the, the clinical characteristics of it so i um, going to ask Claire if she would mind running um, a poll for me because um, so what I was wondering basically is do any of the people here have uh, um, their children um, with one of these um, diagnoses or being it, investigated for one of these um, diagnoses. So I'll just give you a second if, if Claire puts the poll out and then we'll see what the results are. Um, I'm just hoping that this goes the way I think because otherwise the rest of my presentation might not be good. It's just running the poll now. Shall we close it now, James? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the results are 89% said yes and 11% said no. Okay. okay, okay, right. So the vast majority of people have children with one, one or more of these diagnoses or are being investigated for it. So I'm hoping that the rest of this presentation will, um, will kind of be relevant to you. So the theory behind um, The theory behind what I do, and and I'll apologise for this because it can be a little bit dry. So I work from a neuro develop, neurodevelopmental framework, which is bottom-up approach. So regardless of the diagnosis of any of those ones that we've um, seen there on the previous slide, um, I use a very similar approach because the presenting difficulties are all very similar. Um, and it's nice to know that obviously I think there was 89% of you there said yes. And it's it's it, the reason that I did that poll was to obviously know that ev everybody, you know, a lot lots of people are all in the same situation as yourselves. So it's just to kind of let you know that you're not alone out there. Um, so what so what this means um, is that to help a young person who's having difficulties with handwriting or riding a bike, using a knife and fork or tying their shoelaces, I wouldn't teach them any of those skills directly. I'd approach this through um, a sensory, approach, sensory integration approach to mature the, mature the sensory foundations and a knock-on effect where well, this would Im improve their abilities into the task. So um, I often use the example of using a space hopper to help with handwriting and people look at me very confused and I'll say if you think of what's involved in using a space hopper you have to use both sides of your body so stabilizing the paper and using your pen you have to balance you have to have good posture so while you're sat at a desk you have to be able to concentrate 
and you need to plan and organize your movements and you need to be able to track where you're going. So all of those elements are all involved in handwriting. So if we do that, that will also then, because you're using your bilateral skills and your balance skills, it will also improve your ability to use a knife and fork and tie your shoelaces. So instead of teaching one skill, try to have like a holistic approach. Um, so like I was saying before, but this, this version of the pyramid of development, so where I get the referrals are very much at the top in the, in the executive functioning uh, categories. So um, things like handwriting, concentration, attention, regulation, coordination. Um, so all, all of these things is where we, we see the difficulties. And as you can see, they're right up the top. So but where um, and all difficulties in these will lead to um, impact upon their communication, self-confidence, social participation, and ultimately in academic success. So where I work is right down the bottom in that red section. And I try to mature those sensory foundations to have the knock on effect. So when we get to the top, those things, those skills are secure. So um, I'll talk for an example. So I'll, I've tried to make kind of like a, a generic, a generic young person. So for instance, I'd receive a referral from a teacher about a young person that struggles to sit still. They're very clumsy, clumsy they're heavy handed and heavy footed. They're very short attention span. They're unorganized. They break things. And if they play TIG, they might flatten the, the person that they're wanting to play with, but not realize that they're doing it. And then obviously that can cause problems with, with peer relationships. So then after I've got that information, I speak to a parent and the parents tell me that shopping's an impossible task. Meal times can be very challenging. They're always on the go. You hear them before you see them. They're forgetful. They can't tie their shoelaces, they're struggling to ride a bike, they prefer finger foods as they don't as they find a knife and fork very challenging. And when they go to the park, they seem to have no fear and will jump from very, very high heights. Um, so I'm hoping that some of this sounds familiar to um, some people. Um, so that would suggest to me that there might be some difficulties within the sensory foundations. So I'd go through some, I'll quickly go through some terms that you might have heard. So the sensory systems that people often talk about are proprioception, um, and this is your muscle memory system and your body awareness. So this is how your body determines where you are in relation to other things. Your um, vestibular system, so this is your balance system, and this gives lets you know um, where your head is in space. So are you going forward, backwards, up, down? Are you upside down? It lets you know where your orientation is, but it's also responsible for your level of arousal and then the tactile system. So this is our sense of touch, but it works very closely with the proprioceptive system. Um, so as ties in with motor planning um, and also plays a role with emotional regulation. But what I've tried to do is I've tried to stay because it's very difficult to um, go through all of these systems one by one because we'd be here forever. So I've only got half an hour. Um, so I've tried to stick just to like what we would address from a proprioceptive perspective. Um, so if there's a defi deficit in a proprioceptive system, this impacts upon your attention. So you can't settle as you're not confident as, of where your body is in space and where all your body parts are. So you would then struggle to modulate the information. So mo modulation, I had it explained to me as the volume control. So as as we're sat here now, there's the sound of the laptop, there's my voice, there's the sound of traffic outside, and there's the sound of any, any other background noise. But as mature adults, we can filter that out. But some of our young people can't, and everything comes at them at the same level. So the difficulties with modulation can can cause you can you can get overwhelmed very quickly. Um, uh, And if you're not sure of where you are in space, this will affect your body scheme, in turn, your ability to plan and sequence your movements. So you'll see difficulties in fine and gross motor movements. Um, so then put that young person in a class with these difficulties. Um, all of your friends are getting on with your work, but you've missed the instructions because you're struggling to filter out the background noise. Um, you feel like you need to move uh, to get a greater awareness of where 
get a greater awareness of where you are, but you know that you need to sit still and you feel like your handwriting isn't great and you can't seem to get it to the same standard as your friends. So you start, you begin to feel overwhelmed because of the, the noise and the light in the class. Um, and then your teacher is asking you why you've not started your work. So the deficit in the proprioceptive system is causing difficulties with your attention and fine and gross motor skills and your ability to concentrate. But what the teacher is seeing in front of them is the executive function elements. So difficulties with your handwriting, they think you can't attend, they think you can't concentrate, you're distractible. Um, and this may then trigger a fight, flight, freeze response. So you may run, you may freeze or shut down. And I've known people to kind of fall asleep because they've become so overwhelmed. Um, or this may present with challenging behavior if you reaction is fight mode so why does this oh sorry so why does this happen um so what what we do know is that there is um a proven regulation cycle um oh sorry i've skipped ahead there so why, why this happens so there's several theories in relation to why the um these foundations don't mature in the way that you would expect in typically developing children. Some examples, uh, trauma, neglect, or missed opportunities. However, I've worked with some children that come from very stable, loving homes, and, and they have had every experience and opportunity possible, and they've still got the same um, motor coordination, sensory processing challenges as people from differing backgrounds. So the answer is, I think, that nobody 100% knows for sure. So please don't feel that there's something that you've done wrong or that you, you, you haven't done because sometimes these sy systems just take a little longer to mature and develop. And sometimes they need a little nudge along to help them. And that's kind of where we come in. But what this is where I was going on before us, so what we do know is there's a proven regulation cycle. So on the screen is my very bad drawing of a regulation cycle. Um, the green line is baseline, so that's where we would like to be at. Um, and that means you're ready for the day, you're ready to engage, you feel good. But sometimes things happen and that alters our regulation and we begin to become a bit frustrated. And that's the orange line when, when you're on the incline, when there's extra demands, um, someone's said something that you don't like or um, there's lots of noise about, you're struggling with the feel of your jacket or your clothes, you've got new shoes on, they don't feel right. Um, and at this point, this is a point as mature adults where we can reason things and we can start to decline back to baseline, but this doesn't often happen for our young people. So they continue to scale to um, the crisis behavior, which is in red. Um, and once we hit crisis, this can take up to 90 minutes. Um, this can take up to 90 minutes to return to baseline. But in this 90 minutes, you can get repeat escalations in behavior. And I think this is where we often go a little bit wrong at home or as educators. And I know 90 minutes is a long time, but it's just to have that in the back of your mind when your young person is at home. They can, because often people will say, this seemed fine. And then we had a repeat behavior out of nowhere. It's not bit out of nowhere. It's because they've not reached baseline yet. Um, and it's really difficult also in in um, school settings, you know, 90 minutes is two lessons. So and I understand everybody's busy, um, but it's just to just to kind of bear that in mind. Uh, and then you'll reach your post crisis depressive phase where people feel quite, quite remorseful about their actions and then make their way back, back to baseline. But just to bear in mind that due to the challenges that our young people have, they're often not at the green baseline that typically development child would be as uh, or as mature um, as mature adults. We have the tools to dis discharge the negative energy built up in our sensory systems from the day. And it may be it, that we go home from work and we watch Netflix or we have a glass of wine or we go for a run, go to the gym, have a bubble bath. We we can diffuse that negative energy that's charged up in our systems throughout the day. Uh, our, our young people often um, struggle with that or they don't have the outlet to to be able to do that so they'll start where this next green line is at the beginning of the day or they may even be where the other green line is um so it, it can take very very 
very li little to reach a crisis behavior. Um, so, right, okay. so I've just um, quickly got an activity to do. So I just wanted you to just to think because this is um, a good way to kind of try and put you in our children's shoes. So imagine that you're at work and the kids are up all night and you're not feeling 100 percent best. Um, and this work turned this day at work turns out to be an absolute nightmare and then you leave feeling exhausted you get in your car you hit some roadworks and the traffic's horrendous and you know it's going you're going to be sat there for a long time and while you're sat there you feel your eyes start to roll so what do you do in that situation what do you do and this is these things that are just kind of examples of how we get stressed best but these obviously and, and you know how you feel so some people would open the window or some people would turn up the music some people might have a drink if you've got one to hand or or you might put a, a chewing gum in to wake you up you would do anything in that situation to keep yourself going and kind of like the point of this is just to show you all of these work but none of them are wrong so everybody has their own strategies. So when we see our children crashing or um, or spinning or whatever behavior they present with, that's their way of coping. That's their way of regulating themselves. So it's not that it's a challenging behavior. That's their way of regulating themselves, much the way that we would find a way of coping through through that stressful situation. So how do we help? So like I said, I'm going to try to be quite generic because the um, and proprioceptive input would be the go-to for, for like a therapist for, for input to assist regulation. So I thought I'd stick with that um, because you shouldn't have too many, you shouldn't have any adverse effects with proprioceptive input. Um, but there's... And if you read up on proprioceptive input, there are um, there's, there's still a lot of evidence growing because it's still quite a young field. So some people will be a, say that it has very limited impact, and some people will be saying that this is you know this this hundred percent works. Um, but I would speak to an OT before um, uh, speak to an OT before you you ventured away from this. I think. Um, so like I said on the previous slide, these, stra uh, these strategies are not uh, exact science and it's quite difficult to make recommendations because everyone's so difficult and everyone, one thing that works for one person won't work for another person. So what we're trying to do, I'm trying to find the chewing gum or the open window for, for like your child to hopefully if I give you enough options to try, we'll find uh, something that you can put into your toolbox. Um, so just keep things pretty generic um, that shouldn't have a negative impact. I'll base this on proprioceptive input because as a therapist, it's a go-to to assist regulation. Other, in, other input can be just as effective. However, the, it can also have the opposite um, impact if, if used incorrectly or inappropriately. So um, yeah, so proprioceptive input places a stretch or on the muscles and pressure through the joints. In turn, this releases hormones and neurotransmitters that are, not, that are known to make you feel good, like endorphins and dopamine. So very similar to how you'd feel after a run or a session in the gym. So this can be achieved in two ways. Firstly, passively, and these strategies require someone to apply deep pressure to the muscles of a young person or through the use of something weighted. Secondly, actively, and these strategies would require a young person to actively participate in the activity um, that would apply a stretch or pressure through the muscles and joints. So these are just some of the, the strategies um, that we can use. So um, squishing, the passive input, squishing, massage, deep pressure to heads, hands and feet, um, weighted equipment and compression clothing. So compression could be something like a base layer or it could be something that you wear and it inflates. Um, and then examples of active input would be um, body weight exercises, climbing, swimming, long walks, trampolining, um, crashing and rush, rough and tumble play. And there's also um, 
I've put circuits with Sensei on there. That's a, a scheme that I run with some of the young people at Hartwell uh, while we were doing home learning to try to assist their regulation and engagement while they were at home. Um, and then that went on to Facebook also. So that I think you'll get provided a link to some of these videos to, to try with your young people. They, they are an exercise-based um, sensory motor circuit um, aimed probably more at secondary school age children, but the feedback that I got was very positive. Um, so you feel, um, yeah, feel free to give those a try. Um, and all of these are be best used as a proactive strategy to maintain regulation rather than an active reactive strategy. When you feel your young person is beginning to escalate, other things that you may have heard of um, used in the Weversack group is the zones of regulation. So this is a great tool that uses simple language to explore emotions um, and you can make personalized um, visuals so you, um, so you can make that you can make that with your young person and you can use visuals and language that is very, very specific to them. So um, it's a really nice thing. And I, I think I've, I've managed to get um, an example put put uh, put together for you to to be sent out. Um, so some other other hints and tips. Um, so things to consider for home, a cons consistent structure and routine, develop a safe space with a young person. So if you develop that with your young person, um, they have a sense of ownership of that. So if that's their safe space that where they can go to once they're, if they're beginning to um, escalate, um, hopefully they'll take pride of that and they, they, they'll feel safe there and can regulate in there. Um, don't punish, don't punish your young person for actions that they're not in control of. So when they're in crisis, um, clear expectations set out and, and, and consequences set out in advance so that if you're doing in, um, come across challenging behavior, your young person is aware of what the consequences of those actions are. So they're choosing to make those, those choices. Um, Meal times can of, often be quite challenging. So but just um, try to make sure that your young person are, are, is seated, both their feet are flat on the floor. And if this isn't achievable, uh, consider something like a small stool under their feet. Um, you could place something like resistance loops around the feet of the chair. So you can, um, the young person can put their foot behind it and kick into it, giving them the proprioceptive input to hopefully help their regulation. Um, and consider something like a weighted lap pad um, or a fidget cushion but the downside of a fidget cushion is obviously you're raising them uh, further off the further away from the floor um, other difficult um, situations are supermarkets they're very busy different sounds smells light unexpected touch so things like ear defenders or headphones sunglasses gloves um, I put here a weighted backpack, but it doesn't have doesn't have to be one that you specifically buy. Um, it can just be a backpack with some bottles of water in, uh, tins of beans, what whatever works for that young person, or to engage in kind of uh, regulation activities before you go. Um, yeah, I think that's that's uh, about all from from me. So I know I've gone through that at quite a quite a brisk pace but uh, yeah any questions uh, are welcome thanks, thanks thanks james yeah we've got we've got a few questions that have come in um for you so we'll get started on them if that's okay yeah um so the first question um is from a professional it says as a teaching assistant what strategies could i use in the classroom to help a child that can't keep still um yeah so i use here um we use here active seating so we have a few different options we have um rocking chairs or we've just i know they're coming to to market quite soon we're running like a trial of a, a stall called an ergo ergo stall um and i think that gives you the benefit of sitting on a therapy ball so you get lots of movement and you get a little bit of bounce as well but it's not a ball it's a seat so it doesn't it takes away that urge to be able to stand up and kick it um, I have been told that there's weighted therapy balls that you can sit on. Um, therapy balls are really good to sit on for kids that can't sit still. Um, also, things like, um, like I said, a weighted lap pad. 
um, the resistance bands, so you can loop them around the feet of the chair, between the feet of the chair, so the young person can kick their feet in behind them, um, or they can put them at the side and they can kind of stretch up. Um, there's also some activities that I've in, included in um, one of the one of the sheets that I think you'll get sent. That there's um, activities to push into a therapy ball with different body parts, and there's also things that you can do while you're seated, like pushing your hands together, pushing on your head. Um, lifting your bum off your seat and like your, your bum and your feet off your seat and how long you can hold that for. All of these are kind of like proprioceptive based activities um, to hopefully help that young person to sit still. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks, James. Right, okay. Um, I've got another one here for you. Um, so how can I help my child's school implement some of the support strategies you have mentioned today? Ooh. That's a that's a difficult one. I think um, I think the I think schools are often reluctant to um, implement things unless it comes from a professional. From my experience, so it's very difficult. You can um, you can speak. So I would try to go down the route of maybe getting a, a an occupational therapy assessment or an educational psychology assessment, and just to see where your young person's difficulties lie once that report's wrote then those those would go into kind of like a, an ehcp and at the school where then you know you have to put those things in place um the only other thing to do would be either to speak to the teacher and and, and say you've read something or you've been to this webinar um and and lots of things kind of run true with what you're seeing at home and what you're getting reports from in school and and these are the strategies that have that have been put in place you could you could take the the resources that i've put together for you today and you can say that these have obviously come from a professional that that um and, and hopefully that will carry some weight so that they can implement them in the class thanks james um i think if we've got time for another two questions if that's okay with you yeah. um so We've had a, a question come in that says, my child finds the school routine really stressful. Can you offer ad any advice or tips for making this a bit easier on, on her? Yeah, sorry, you, you broke up at the beginning there, Claire. I'm oh, sorry, I'll say that again. Um, my child finds the school routine really stressful. Can you offer any advice or tips for making this easier on her? Yeah, um, I think it's it's preparation i think so like things like visuals um uh having a very like a, with with a school you should have a very structured routine to hopefully you can make those visuals so that, and 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 working with the teacher to have those visuals available so it takes that demand off somebody having to remember things um and um uh, uh, yeah maybe some regulation activities before you go to school um maybe a extra little bit of weighted weighted um weight in your in in the, the backpack to help them to to modulate and regulate themselves um i think one of the main one things that i would do is try to figure out exactly what it is that's causing the you know what what it is that's causing the anxiety or or the challenge to that that young person because it it's that it could be a multitude of things it could be that that you know they're going into maths the first thing on a monday and they really don't like maths um or it could be that they're having a disagreement with somebody in the in the school um so i think it's it's it would it would take a little bit of unpicking um but yeah so like regulation strategies and and just preparation um you know talking through you know talking through um what what their difficulties are and, and maybe come up with strategies that that they they may even come up with strategies themselves that they can they can kind of um they can kind of um work for themselves because we often like i'll often talk about the the size the the um the size of a problem so if if something's you know if it's just a disagreement with somebody in school is that causing them lots and lots of anxiety so their reaction to that would be like a 10 whereas the actual problem is a four so the, their reaction should be a four if that makes sense um so it could be a little bit of just just discussing around what what it is that is that is exactly causing the the anxieties and the stress around that and unpicking that a little bit 
Okay, thanks, James. We'll, we'll have our last question now. So, um, as a parent of a young person with sensory needs and probable ASD, what strategies would you advise to start um, with um, uh, for, for a child who's currently not able to attend school and is reluctant to leave the house? Um, sm small steps, I think. Um, if, if, if they are diagnosed as having um, sensory processing difficulties, hopefully you would have access to somebody who could do some um, work with your, with your young person in the house and do a very, very graded approach to, um, to getting outside. So the first step would probably be to go out into the garden, following lots and lots of, regula lots of regulation um, and, and to, um, you know, to, just to explore outside and then very, very small steps. You know, it may be that um, a, just a trip to get to the car might be the next step and set, set out very, you know, set out goals and maybe it's like a reward system as, to, as they achieve each goal. But um, it, the, with, with sensory processing, there's no kind of like clear cut answer, I don't think. I think it's a, a lot of trial and error. Like I'll often do an assessment and I'll think, right, this is what I need to do. But when I actually treat a young person, I'll completely change my mind and I'll take a completely different approach, um, which is which is why it's quite dif difficult to to give exact advice on this because it it may be um, it may be um, tactile the tactile system which is obviously the the which is normally the one that's a little bit overlooked could be driving all the the, the problems it might be like issues with their shoes and socks and clothes it might be anxiety driven. Um, which is often the case with people with ASD, um, and and or maybe like the rigidity of thought that they've they've got set into that routine, and now they don't see a purpose for school. So it's I think there'd be a a lot of, but definitely 100%. I would start with regulation, and then a very very graded approach, um, to to take very small steps to achieve your final goal of getting back to school. But look at compensatory strategies like weighted vests or, or compression jackets um, uh, and weighted backpacks, uh, ear defenders, things like that. But can consult with an occupational therapist first so that you're getting the right size and everything like that for, for your young person. Thanks, James. That that was wonderful. A really great presentation to finish the day on. Um, 